So, hello and welcome everyone who is joining us live and for those watching the recording. We are here for the Raise Your Voice, Get Out the Vote webinar, a collaboration with Union of Concerned Scientists. My name is Daniela Bernal. I am the Director of Member Services at SACNAST. And before we officially begin, I'd like to start the way we start all of SACNAST events with a brief land acknowledgement. SACNAST is a fully inclusive organization dedicated to achieving true diversity in STEM. As the nation's largest multicultural and multidisciplinary STEM diversity organization, SACNAST creates space where all members, volunteers, and partners feel they belong and can embrace their intersectional identities. SACNAST is based out of California, which is the original homelands to over 200 tribal nations, bands, and rancherias of Native American indigenous people. We would like to take this time to acknowledge the original caretakers of the lands which we all live and work and honor the rich culture of the indigenous people across our country. Check out the link in the chat, which I will pop in in a few to learn more about the lands you reside in, visit and are around. Also, the link is on the screen. Okay, now, I am super excited to welcome you to today's webinar. I'm going to share real quick just about how today's going to go, um, introduce you to the folks you see on your screen, and then share how we can interact throughout today. Uh, briefly, as when we do get to the Q&A, you can absolutely submit your questions via the Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom navigation. Um, However, you can do that at any point during the presentation, so feel free to pop in those questions as they come to you. If you put them in the chat too, I'll try to move them over and that works as well. And then after the Q&A and presentation, we will have some useful links and resources that you can take with you, so make sure you stick around for those. And then throughout uh, the next hour or so, we'd love for you to interact in the chat. We encourage you to be polite and respectful, share your comments, your reactions. We have those emoji reactions at the bottom. Um, and we will get started. So if you, if for those who might be joining a SACNAS webinar for the first time, welcome. For those returning, welcome back. Briefly, SACNAS is an inclusive organization. We are a multicultural and multidisciplinary community with culturally centered programs, events, services, and year-round opportunities to bring your whole self to STEM. We just celebrated 50 years of achieving true diversity. And so one of our goals as an organization and a community is to equip our members with the tools they need to advance in their educations and careers not just as a scientist or a STEM professional, but as I said, as a whole person, as a leader in their community. So following this theme, it is my honor to introduce you to today's speakers who are gonna be sharing with us some super interesting information and tools and tips on engaging in the upcoming election. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to our speakers. I'd like to introduce Cynthia Prieto Diaz, civic scientists, engineers, and scientists acting locally, and Melissa Varga, Science Network Senior Manager of Union of Concerned Scientists. Welcome. Thanks, Daniela. Um, I'm really excited to be here with you all. Um, I'm going to try to do two things at once and share my screen and introduce myself. Um, as Daniela mentioned, I'm the senior manager of the Science Network at UCS. Um, my background is actually in political organizing. So I um, am really excited to get to bring some of those skills to helping scientists engage in our democracy and bring their expertise, um, usually more on the policy advocacy front, um, but it is really important to also think about how we're engaging in elections what we're going to talk about today. Um, and just a, a quick disclaimer, uh, the Union of Concerned Scientists is a 501c3 nonpartisan nonprofit. So we do not endorse or support any candidates or political parties for office. So everything I'm sharing will be um, nonpartisan. Uh, and I'll hand it over to Cynthia. Hi. Uh, thank you so much. Um, as mentioned, my name is Cynthia Prieto Diaz, and I am not only a civic scientist, but a punk rock civic scientist um, with 
Yes. So more importantly, that all of the the things that I've I've studied, I think it's really important to highlight that I am a proud daughter of immigrants. Um, and yes, so with that, I go at life very hard. My background or my profession has been as a biomedical engineer. And most recently, I turned into a public health consultant. So really wanting to support and um, help my community, which is um, the nonprofit that I am a part of, Engineers and Scientists Acting Locally, that is also nonpartisan, just wanting to encourage STEM professionals and students to engage civically. Happy to be here. Thank you. And just a quick overview of the learning objectives for today. Um, so we hope that you'll walk away from this session with an understanding of how you can engage around the election, regardless of whether or not you're eligible to vote. Um, have access to resources where you can find reliable and nonpartisan information about voting. Um, have the ability to articulate the connection between science and democracy, and especially why it's so important for scientists and STEM students to be engaging, uh, as well as some tools for how to inoculate yourself against disinformation. Um, with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Cynthia to talk a little bit about like why we are here and why this moment is so important. Yes, thank you. Um, so <laughs> stepping up, because our communities do need us. So something that I may have skipped over completely. So by training, I am an applied scientist. So hence the biomedical engineering. But I think since youth, I, I came of age and I, I think it's really important to highlight that I came of age in a time when music was very influential into how I viewed the world. Um, albums were coming out related to rock against bush if you remember that era so that's really how i got involved even before i could vote not only because of the age thing right you need to be 18 but because i was a naturalized citizen so i wasn't able to vote yet so yes stepping up for communities and here i have an awesome artwork that is tu lucha es mi lucha your struggle is my struggle and i think as I mentioned, science to me um, and my education has allowed me to acknowledge that whether we like it or not, science touches all of our lives every day, right? The air that we breathe, how we interact, you know, the cars that we move about in, right? That's, that's science right there and engineering. Um, so yes, it's all around us and STEM like many things in this world is all about moving forward, right? What are we learning? Um, science is always evolving. So I think um, that's how I view the world. And I hope that others also acknowledge that, that, um, that it goes beyond just the voting aspect. And we'll definitely highlight that in today's uh, webinar. Thanks, Cynthia, for that grounding, because um, it, we are going to talk a lot about voting as one way to engage, but it really is just a first step, right? So important to think about how science um, and democracy and our society is interacting uh, around us every single day, not just during election time. Um, so let's let's talk a little bit about voting. Um, I wanted to highlight why this election cycle is especially important for youth voters. Um, so I'm gonna be sharing a lot of numbers as part of my presentation, because I feel like the, the data behind, um, the data and research behind science, uh, social science and voting is really interesting. Um, so a few numbers for you. Um, an estimated 15.4 million eligible young people will have turned 18 between the 2020 election and this year's election day. That means that between seven to nine million more members of 
uh, Gen Z, which is more racially and culturally diverse, could cast their ballots for the first time in 2024. While the number of uh, predominantly white baby boomers and older generations uh, may decline uh, in this year's election. Um, so, you know, as a result, Gen Z and millennials have a real opportunity to make their voices heard in ways that um, we haven't seen before yet. And they may make up the majority of voters um, for the first time in this election, but then moving ahead for several decades. So there, there's huge potential here. So let's talk about how to make sure that youth voter turnout continues to increase in 2024. So I wanted to share four evidence-based tactics for increasing voter turnout. The first is make a plan to vote. So in one study of over 287,000 registered voters, researchers saw an increased turnout of 4.1% and up to 9.1% for single voter households, simply by asking voters what time they would vote, when they or where they would be coming from, uh, and what they would be doing beforehand. So actually like making them think through what their plan was to get to the, the polling place. So if you are talking with someone in your network and wanna increase the likelihood that they actually cast their ballot, walk through these questions with them. Um, this study was conducted pre-pandemic, so there was um, a real focus on voting in person, but the same tactics apply if you're going to vote by mail, you know, thinking through when will you sit down to fill out your ballot, um, when and how will you mail it, do you have stamps to mail it, um, those sorts of step-by-step uh, -step, um, tactics make it more likely that you'll actually go through with voting. Third is, or second is recruit three friends to vote. Uh, this is also called vote tripling pledges, and it really is as simple as asking three friends to vote and then following up with them as it gets closer to election day to make sure that they actually have a plan to vote and go through with it. Um, one study of voter engagement found that when a person was asked to vote by someone that they knew, the likelihood of them voting increased by 8.3%. So that's pretty significant. That's uh, be, in part because in comparison to interactions with strangers, familiar relationships provide better opportunities for contact, right? You're probably a trusted messenger. You probably have more opportunities to um, interact with your friends and family and maybe nudge them a couple times. Uh, and folks are more likely to listen to you than a stranger if you're a trusted messenger, right? You can also personalize your ask based on what issues they know you, you know that they care about and uh, what you know that they're concerned about. So uh, another great thing about this study is that um, you can actually do this through text messaging or uh, messaging on social media apps as well. It doesn't just have to be in person. Third is find the right messenger. So vote tripling can be a really powerful tactic for getting your friends and family to vote um, if you are a trusted messenger for your friends and family. But sometimes, you know, your friends and family, you're not on the same page, right? So uh, social mobilization research finds that politically disengaged people may actually be the most powerful messengers overall because they signal to people that like, this time it's different. This time, even people who don't normally pay attention to the election are actually getting um, activated and are mobilizing and are turning out to vote. So if you tend to be a little bit more on the activist side, as I do, and your friends and family are used to tuning you out, um, maybe you're not the right messenger for them. Maybe you need to find one of those non-activists and get them to remind their friends and family to vote. And that may be uh, more powerful. Uh, finally, talk about voting as a social norm. Talk about voting as something everyone is doing. Um, in two get out the vote field experiments, researchers found that messages emphasizing low turnout are less effective at mobilizing and mo motivating voters than messages emphasizing high expected turnout. Um, these findings suggest that talking about voting as the norm can increase turnout, especially among folks who don't always vote, who only vote occasionally or infrequently. 
So if you're trying to get folks to turn out to vote, talk about um, high anticipated turnout, something that you know everyone is doing. Um, additionally, this study suggests that the way that the media talks about low turnout in elections may actually be making this problem worse. Um, so don't add to the problem, you know, try to emphasize high anticipated voter turnout and voting as a social norm when you're talking about engagement. All right, so we're going to take a few minutes to put this into action right now. Um, I'm going to try to play some music in a second. Um, I would love for us to take just a, a less than three minutes um, to either make your plan to vote or make a plan to register if you haven't registered. I recommend turbovote.org as a trusted nonpartisan tool for doing this. Um, they really respect people's privacy and don't give away any of your personal information. Um, though there are other websites, I really respect TurboVote. Or you can recruit three friends to vote, uh, draft up a little message and text them right now. So I'm gonna share some, some music and we're gonna take three minutes and six seconds. Right. Um, if anyone wants to share, I would love to hear from folks if they, you know, made their plan to vote or if they texted a couple friends. I don't know if maybe folks can share in the chat or we have a small group. So if anyone wants to come off mute, if that's possible, I welcome that as well.
thank you for verifying your registration. Friend commenting in the chat. <laughs> I will share that I texted my brother because he uh, moved in the past couple months and I wanted to make sure he is registered in his new location. Oh, awesome. Cynthia also texted her family. Daniela texted her cousin. Um, and then Soraya, Soraya, sorry, texted younger siblings. Excellent. Thank you all for taking that. Just three minutes. And uh, just three minutes and you know, this really can make a difference is one step. All right, let's move along. Um, I know I got everyone pumped up, feeling good about taking action. I want to bring us down just a little bit and emphasize that, you know, even though there are really positive trends that are happening around student voting and civic participation, um, which we should be excited about, but we also know that anti-democratic forces are paying attention to these trends as well, and they are starting to push back. So from creating barriers to student voter registration, uh, more restrictive voter ID laws, limited access to campus polling places, restricting early voting, all sorts of things, we are starting to see efforts to suppress student voting increasing. Um, so countering disinformation around voting is even more important in this moment where um, we already know that bad actors are trying to suppress people's votes. Um, so I wanna quickly share a couple, three tips for countering disinformation. Um, and I've distilled it down to two sentences. Avoid amplifying the disinformation spread by bad actors whenever possible. Replace it with accurate, aspirational, and actionable content instead. So let's break that down. Um, one of the most important things to help fight disinformation is to stop spreading it and amplify better ideas instead. That means don't share or amplify the disinformation at all. Don't share it to try to fact check it. Don't share it to make fun of it because sometimes it's kind of absurd. Um, don't share it to correct it. Just don't share it because anytime you share it, you are spreading it further and helping to do the bad actors work for them. When you see disinformation, replace it, don't repeat it. So for example, instead of re repeating or retweeting um, a piece of disinformation, you can share some engaging information that gives people um, accurate you know, facts or information to hold on to instead. Um, if you've ever heard the phrase, don't think of an elephant, you know, as soon as you say that, what do you immediately picture? An elephant, right? So instead of saying, don't think about this thing, <laughs> don't think about this disinformation, you need to replace it with something tangible and accurate instead. So for example, if you see a post on social media where someone says, um, because they anticipate high voter turnout this year, you'll actually be able to cast your ballot on the day after election day too. Uh, what you don't say is, no, you won't be able to vote the day after election day. Like that doesn't give that doesn't replace it with something that people can grab onto, right? That's accurate. What you can say is that there are influencers online who are trying to spread disinformation about when you can vote, and you can always check back with trusted sources like your board of elections to learn about where and when you can cast your ballot. So when you're replacing, think about the three A's to develop a narrative that can help inoculate people against disinformation. Um, so that's accurate, aspirational, and actionable. Accurate, an accurate message reflects the truth as validated by experience and research. An aspirational message offers um, something that inspires audiences around your call to action. And an actionable message offers clear, practical next steps. So just to put it into place uh, or put it into practice, um, this is an example pulled from the 2020 election. Um, 
And this is from an example that communication strategist uh, Sabrina Joy Stevens used in creating our countering disinformation resources for UCS. So I'm going to read a written description of the piece of disinformation and then read an example of how to respond to the disinformation without repeating or amplifying it. So replace this. After it was announced that registered voters in Michigan would receive applications for absentee ballots in the mail, Trump took to Twitter to claim that the move was done, quote unquote, illegally. Trump later threatened to suspend federal funding to Nevada, which is holding a mail-in primary election, claiming it would create a great voter fraud scenario and allow people to cheat in elections, the Hill reports. And this is how you would replace it. On Wednesday, President Trump attacked states like Michigan and Nevada for protecting voters from COVID-19 in upcoming elections by sending applications for absentee ballots. So you can see how the same messaging was provided without repeating or elevating the disinformation from former President Trump during that last presidential election. I know this was a lot. Usually I give this information in a two hour training instead of five minutes. Um, and I'll share a link to um, another slightly longer training we have on countering disinformation around voting uh, at the end of this training. Um, but with that, I'm going to hand it back to Cynthia to talk about some other ways you can engage, um, not just around elections, but also throughout the year. That's okay. Uh, we would also encourage um, if there are any questions, so we're happy to take those as we continue moving forward. Um, yes, or if you have any uh, thoughts to share. But yes, we'll, we can definitely go into next steps. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you, Melissa, for going through, um, yeah, just trying to amplify the voting, which is important. But as I mentioned earlier, it is not the start and the stop, right? Um, when it comes to being engaged civically. So as Melissa mentioned, um, there is an upcoming training if you want to learn more about countering disinformation as well as misinformation. Uh, coming up September 26. Thank you so much. Oh, I thought they were at. Oh, yes, I see the link in the chat now. Perfect. And um, we may or may not have mentioned this, but there's an upcoming workshop that you'll be able to attend at SACNIS. And it is about centering community needs in our local, um, in local science policy and advocacy. So we would love it for you to join us Friday afternoon. And we would also encourage you as part of not just voting and democracy, but if you wanna connect with other individuals, we invite you to um, join the Union of Concerned Scientists Science Network, and there you can learn more. Um, another way that you can engage and something that was earlier in our presentation was a photo of me casting my ballot, but also becoming a poll worker yourself. Happy to talk about my experience. That's something that I have done um, as my time and schedule has permitted. So that's something that I would definitely encourage. You can see democracy in action, which is really exciting, as well as ensure that um, individuals feel safe when they're when they're casting their their votes. And something that I've also have done recently has been serving as a public health commissioner in Alameda County in the San Francisco Bay Area. So highly encourage you to look at what your city or your county is doing and look into boards and commissions. Maybe there's a particular interest of yours. Mine was in public health, but maybe you have some knowledge that you could share. Um, and they are always looking for individuals. So if that's something that you're really interested in, I was very new to the process and it's it's a steep learning curve, but people are there to support you. They want they want those vacancies filled. So why not you? And then I would also encourage you all to attend your city meetings um, and learn about this, uh, the inner workings of your city. Where are you living? Right. Like this is the air that you're breathing. Um, for me, it was really exciting to learn that my city uh, was working on a parks and rec like master plan. So, hey, I like parks. I have something to say. Uh, 
what kind of parks do we want, right? Um, so yes. And then lastly, I would also encourage you that if you don't see the leaders that you want, encourage encourage your friends. Like if you see a leader, like I see a leader in Melissa, um, and I'm like, <laughs> they would be a great um, public servant, right? So encourage them to run for office or, or maybe yourself like maybe we want more tattooed individuals in office right because that that means that they're decisive <laughs> so i would love to um also highlight an organization that focuses on encouraging individuals with stem backgrounds to run for office they are partisan as they do endorse candidates but if that's something of interest i would encourage you to to look at that organization uh 314 action and or even just connect with individuals. Hey, you have a STEM background. How did you get into maybe policy development or, you know, your city council? And yes, <laughs> happy to take any questions. All right. Thank you so much, Cynthia, Melissa. That was awesome. I think a lot of information that people are probably processing and there's a lot of links in the chat. So a couple things for as we get started with Q&A for folks, of course, definitely feel free to put uh, those questions in the Q&A or even in the chat, honestly. Um, and, you know, raise your hand if you'd like to come off mute. That works as well. I know a few have come in. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to mention before we get to the questions is that all the links in the chat will be in a follow up email. So if you want to open them up now, great. If you're, uh, you know, trying to keep everything orga organized, you will get those as well. Um, OK, so with that, let's see. I saw a few here in the chat for Melissa and Cynthia. Um, let's see. I think the first one I saw is we when when voting on the ballot, do we have to select local candidates to vote on as well or only presidential candidates? And I'll just add, I think, you know, with different um, uh, different experiences voting for many of us, it might be the first time, it might be a long time since we voted, or maybe we do this every time. Um, so with that, uh, that question about how do we select the candidates we're voting on? Cynthia, do you want to go first or do you want me to take it? I'm happy either way. <laughs> go for it. All right. <laughs> so I will read the question again just to make sure. So when voting on the ballot, do we have to select local candidates to vote on as well or only presidential candidates? So yes, that is a great question. Um, I will say that it is, to my understanding, um, per your county. So in the upcoming election, yes, we will have the opportunity to vote for the presidential candidate, right? Um, as it is every four years, and everyone, please correct me if I'm wrong, right? Um, but during that time, there's also things happening at the local levels, and sometimes those have the most impact on your day-to-day -day lives, right? So it's really important, something that I've appreciated in my county. Before we even get our mail-in ballots, they send out these pamphlet books or even they provide it digitally on what are maybe propositions or maybe bond measures. Um, the city is asking for money and you know how is that going to impact? And then I like to take it on as like a home, homework assignment. Okay, let me read into this even before I get my ballot and start making notes on that pamphlet book that I can later recycle. <laughs> but yes, Melissa? No, I think you covered it. Um, I'll just add that um, when I logged into TurboVote, um, there is a what's on your ballot button. So that way that can help you give a sense of, or give you a sense of, you know, which candidates um, are up for election this year. So you can do some research, especially on those local candidates that you, you know, probably hearing aren't hearing as much about in the news, but like Cynthia said, are really important. Um, and it will also show you if there are ballot measures um, that you can look into to see, you know, what issues uh, you you get to vote on this year. 
Excellent. Thank you. Um, the next question I have here is, uh, and I think you touched on, you know, the, it, it's not just about voting, although that is a very important part of it, um, but there's lots of ways to be engaged. And so I think at the beginning we did the, the exercise of messaging folks um, and reaching out to family and friends. The question I got here is, uh, do you have any suggestions on how to really craft that message that you send to people on encouraging them to either vote or also participate? Things you should and maybe or maybe shouldn't include in how you reach out to folks. Sure, I can go first and then Cynthia, you can fill in. Um, I think it sort of depends on who your audience is, right? But one thing that you could consider starting with is mentioning an issue that you know that they care about and you could keep it broad. Um, it could be things like, I know you're really active in your community. You know, have you made a plan to vote yet this year? Or I know you really care about, um, you know, access to bike lanes, which is just something that's an issue that I personally care about, right? Like, have you have you planned on on voting for candidates that support that this year? Um, or just like looking for an entry point to connect um, with, uh, to connect issues that they care about broadly to this upcoming election. Um, and if they respond with like, oh, I don't think that issue's on a ballot, um, I'm sure that a candidate has a stance on whatever issue it is that they are passionate about. So encouraging them to do a little bit of research, um, maybe even offering to help by sending some trusted resources for where they can look up information about candidates. Um, Ballotpedia, I think is a good one because they have um, lots of candidates and uh, ballot initiatives covered on there in a nonpartisan way. Um, so finding that entry point, um, I would, in general, approach this conversation in a in a calm and non-judgmental manner, right? Like we're encouraging people to vote; they may not vote the way that you will, and that's okay. We live in a democracy; not everyone is going to vote the same way. Um, so, you know, trying not to bring in necessarily your <laughs> your biases, um, but in pro approaching this as an opportunity for them to be civically engaged um, and just encouraging them to have good civic habits in our democracy. Um, Cynthia, anything you want to add? I just really want to highlight that I love that you mentioned the tailoring your messaging to your audience. I think that's really important, right? And making it about something that they care about, right? Or like if it's the economy, or maybe that's something that you hear them maybe not speak too fondly of right or complain about like oh I am so like everything is super expensive right um and <laughs> this might be my own biases and how I view the world so coming at it like well what is it that we can do right or who is working on this um yeah. because it's not a single it's not just it's not just you worried about that right and and yes, and sometimes you might um, also not just get individuals that may not have the same view or perspective of the world as you, and that and that's okay, right? Um, it's about, and and I think I saw in another question about like being mindful of one another and respecting one another, and and that's okay that we can have disagreements, but I think everyone in general just wants to live, you know, a fulfilling life, <laughs> nice. Yes. So tailoring our messaging um, when we have these conversations. Thanks. Awesome. That's really, really good to hear. Um, and maybe that's a good transition to this next question that I did also see in the chat about being mindful. So the question is, if there are any tips to care for and be mindful of our mental health and well-being during election season? Cynthia, do you want to go first? Um, I just had a laugh because, <laughs> because yes, we do want to be mindful of our own. And I know that, you know, we just had the, the debate that is very top of mind for everyone right now, right? And you'll probably see a lot of discourse online um, and it can make you feel certain ways, right? On how it went. Um, so yeah, I, I think it, 
I think it's at the individual level, right? Like what you need to to make sure that you're taking care of your own mental health. If it's separating, maybe maybe you're hearing too much about certain things, right? So it's okay to take a step back. Sometimes I take a step back from listening to what's going on in the news. But um, so that's okay to do as well. But if people do want to have that conversation, making sure, and I think that also goes back to the tailoring of messaging, how we engage with other individuals, maybe it's about like, hey, you know, this is something that, you know, you want to talk about with other people, you know, how do you, how do you feel about it? But going at it uh, with the perspective of I'm not going to be judgmental of others. And hopefully they, they provide that same respect to me. Yeah, Melissa? This is such a great question. Um, and to, yeah, just build off of what Cynthia shared. Um, I think being really intentional about how you're engaging online and with social media has helped me. Um, it's easy for me to get sucked into a number of political articles, like reading them, because I, I want to know what's going on, right? And then I always feel awful about <laughs> the world <laughs> after reading them. So being really intentional about how much time I'm spending online and what I'm doing online um, around political news has been helpful for me. And another area is that I do have some anxiety around uh, how this presidential election is going to go. And one thing that has helped me alleviate that is by taking action. Um, there are some great uh, websites out there that allow you to um, uh, write letters to folks to remind them to register and vote in the upcoming election. Um, some are partisan and some are nonpartisan. So, um, look into that, that can feel really uh, impactful. And it's also a great uh, activity to do with a couple of friends, like have them over for coffee and you write some letters and you feel better about the world. Um, you could also, you know, volunteer on a campaign or, or engage in your community in some of the other ways that Cynthia uh, named. So just looking for ways to um, put that anxiety to work, I guess, is the way that I think about it, so that it's not just all up in your head, but that you feel like you're contributing. Yeah, have a healthy outlet, as Cynthia said. That is a great suggestion. I love the um, the idea of uh, getting some friends together, writing letters for those who might be part of a, chap a SACNIS chapter or a chapter of another organization. That could be a great activity to do at this early part of the year. Um, and, and that also, I think, brings us to another question. And Cynthia touched on that you served as a pool worker. Um, and the question was, if you could share a little bit more about that as, as another example of maybe how to channel uh, energy around the election. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I am in the process of moving. So I also had to re-register and had to do it twice because I wanted to make sure that I was super registered in my new county. But I reached out to my office. Excuse me if I get the name wrong, but um, yeah, the office of, or the electoral board for my new county. And I said, hey, I, I've previously served as a poll worker. How can I be of service? And sometimes they have a quick application. The application is your name. You don't need to have previous experience because every cycle they will train you on how to use the equipment. Also, I, I think we have um, a great privilege if we do have that STEM background, because what are you all about? Quality control. <laughs> and um, that's something that you bring to the table. There, there's a manual that they provide you with. So yes, my first time, I can't recall I'm in California but it was whenever the governor recall election was and that was my first time serving as a poll worker so maybe if it's coming up in November my training happened it's at the end of this month actually so they they will space it out and then after your in-person training where they go through the process you know and your responsibilities in that role like you're really there to serve the public and making sure that people feel safe. It was during COVID. So making sure that people feel safe casting their ballot. Yes, sometimes there will be individuals that um, 
might come in um, and want to be confrontational. I think that's something to acknowledge, you know, with, with our current climate. Um, but not being scared, like there are other individuals there. And we're also ensuring that, you know, that you feel safe in your role there to, to witness and support our democracy. So to me, it was really, um, yeah, it was such an honor to be able to serve and to help individuals. Also, if you're bilingual, it it's um, that is super needed, right? Because we do um, have ballots in multiple languages. And if you're able to assist individuals, hey, it's okay. We also have, um, I don't know if it's like this in all the states, but in California, at least, the default is for it to be in English and Spanish, acknowledging that, you know, the United States, like, we're, we're a land of immigrants. Um, so I think that's, that's a really great way to get involved and see democracy in action. To me, that was so exciting. I'm just like, not only am I voting, but I'm helping other people, you know, regardless of how they vote, you know, to partake in that. I hope I answered <laughs> how my experience was. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I think the cool part of that is that you touched on and we, we've touched on a couple of times now, the some of the ways that we're uniquely um, skilled and uh, should be engaging in the election, not just around um, knowing a second language, but as scientists and how that can contribute some special skills um, to all of this. So I appreciate that response. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, the next question I got was around, um, I think because you mentioned the uh, session that in workshop that we'll be having at NDI STEM. And for those, um, I will share a link in the chat. Our upcoming SACNAS conference is the National Diversity in STEM Conference. It is our annual event every October. This year we will be in Phoenix, Arizona, and we're super excited to have lots of different sessions, including a workshop uh, featuring the two of you again. And so I think the question here is if you could talk a little more, maybe give us a sneak peek of what that uh, workshop will look like and how maybe that will be a continuation of, of this topic. Yeah, um, I think the one of the initial ideas or goals for this session was to touch on how scientists are uniquely poised to support communities um, that are working on local policy issues or state policy issues. So thinking about um, what does offering technical support look like around local policy um, and how to engage with communities in ways that um, supports relationship building and building equitable partnerships. Um, because if you're not from that community, maybe you're there for college or maybe you've moved recently, um, it's really important to center relationship building um, when you're working with a, a new community. So that's uh, some of what I believe we'll touch on. And we're going to have some incredible panelists, including Cynthia, to share case studies and examples of what that has looked like in various different contexts. So maybe I can pass it to Cynthia to talk about what she's going to, a little sneak peek of what she's going to cover. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so there will be case studies, uh, starting with uh, where I reside and how I got involved. It, um, super sneak peek. <laughs> it was a result of working from home and really experiencing my neighborhood and my community for the first time 24-7, 365. And um, yeah, just witnessing, you know, like I... I had no idea was what was going on during the day, you know, when I was away at work and acknowledging that and then coming to the realization that, okay, I have this STEM background. If I'm seeing pollution, what can I do about it? And not being scared to uh, something that I didn't mention, not just going to city council meetings, but emailing <laughs> and asking, hey, uh, hi, city council members, I am a resident here. And I was wondering about X, Y, and Z, you know, may we have coffee? May we meet? I don't even know you <laughs> and you represent me. Um, so how I got involved and 
how you don't need to have all the answers, right? Or you don't need to um, have a policy background in order to start engaging. That's awesome. Thank you. I think we'll all be looking forward to that and I'll share uh, towards the end uh, some more information about attending the conference for those who are interested. Um, I think maybe we have time for one more question um, unless there's and then maybe I'll ask for like some final thoughts too. Um, but the, next, the last question I, I have here is about kind of what to do after the election. I think there's a lot of really good tips and suggestions and resources and ways to channel our energy and excitement leading up to the election and during the election. Um, but are there um, things that we can do afterwards maybe to, to stay uh, engaged in what's going on and then um, to, to continue our engagement in, in democracy? Yeah, uh, well, once candidates are in office, you get to build a relationship with them and, and hold them accountable to some of the promises that they made on the campaign trail and make sure that they are uh, prioritizing the issues that you care about um, as a constituent. So um, looking for opportunities to um, schedule meetings with your city council members or attending city council meetings just to learn about what's going on and ways you can stay involved. Um, or, you know, looking at different levels of government, you could even, you know, meet in district with your member of Congress um, if it's a federal policy issue that you care about. Um, so I would say look for opportunities to start building those relationships with um, elected officials or their staff. Their staff are often, you know, even more accessible and really excited to talk with constituents, especially constituents who have a STEM background and want to use that to help inform policy. That's a real asset for folks who are in office. So, um, you know, day after election day, <laughs> or maybe give them a couple days, but uh, feel free to reach out and, and start building those relationships. Um, regardless of what side of the aisle they're on, you know, they are elected to represent you. Um, and it's worth trying to build that relationship. And like I said, hold them accountable. Cynthia? <laughs> yes. Um... I love that accountability. So I would also highly encourage you um, to attend or not even like maybe you can't attend, but rewatch the webinar. So everything is um, readily available to the public, these city council meetings. So maybe you can't attend in person, but sometimes they're provided virtually, which is nice. Um, and th they're all recorded. So you can always go back in and see, you know, what are they talking about or um, when it comes to accountability, you know, what are our representatives working on or what are they saying? Um, something I would also encourage you, and I think this ties back to making sure that our own mental health and well-being is, um, is taken care of, is maybe if it's helpful to you, like just disconnecting, you know, I know there's like a big ramp up to November, right? And you know, I'll be busy if I'm supporting the polls and maybe we have certain counters that weren't, weren't um, that mindful or demure. <laughs> so so um, just, yeah, taking that step back for me, I am excited to to go run, just being out in nature and as a way of recentering myself and like, okay, what is my what is my place in this universe? And for the time that I'm, maybe this is too much, but for the time that I'm here, how am I making it the best for those around me? Thank you. Oh my goodness. Thank you. I see the little hearts too. I think that is a beautiful way uh, to close the Q&A. So thank you um, on behalf of SACNAS and our members. Cynthia and Melissa, thank you so much for sharing all of that super valuable information. I'm sure we could have a million more questions for you, but that's why I'm going to pivot us to share just some closing thoughts, including how to stay connected with Melissa and Cynthia and others on this topic. Um, so I'm going to share my screen really quickly. No surprise here, hopefully, but um, I mentioned 
the NDI STEM conference is coming up. It's going to be on Halloween this year uh, in Phoenix, Arizona. We're super excited to be in, in Phoenix and in Arizona for the first time in a long time. It's a great conference. It's not your typical STEM conference. We celebrate culture, belonging, and community very strongly um, amongst all of the STEM wonderful keynote speakers and uh, research presentations and uh, STEM symposia sessions. We'll also have a very large exhibit hall featuring graduate schools uh, and uh, different career opportunities. So lots to do, lots to learn about the conference if you've never been. Uh, our website right there is sacnus.org and of course um, one of the many wonderful sessions that will be part of that conference will be the one shared here. So I think that would be a great way to hopefully if you get to attend meet Cynthia and Melissa in person um, and continue the conversation. Uh, other than that, I just want to thank you both again so much for your collaboration and for sharing with our community. It's extremely valuable for us to find proactive and positive ways to engage, and I appreciate that very much. For our participants, again, all the links in the chat and, and maybe a few others that we can throw in there, we will put in a follow-up email, so you'll get that to your inbox. You'll also get the recording of this event in case you'd like to rewatch and, and redo some of it. Um, and then lastly, at the end of closing of this webinar, there is a survey that's going to pop up for you. Uh, I really appreciate and hope that you will take that survey and give us not just feedback on this webinar, um, but even suggestions on future topics that you'd like for SACNAS to host. Um, other than that, we hope you will stay connected with us by visiting SACNAS.org and again, get more information about ways to stay involved uh, in webinars like this and other events. So with that, thank you again very, very much. I hope you all have a wonderful day, and we will see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. See you at the thank conference. You. Take care. See you in Phoenix.